basically was he would ask if he, you know, and I would try and, you know, please in some way, you know, try and come up with the goods. And that was that was the point. During the sessions, Morrissey employed unique methods of reconstruction to fit his lyrical vision to that of the existing song. I'd do a backing track, hearing like a verse and a chorus, and when Morrissey came in and, and he would listen to the backing track being recorded with his book of lyrics and stuff like that, and then he'd go away, then he'd come back and do a vocal, and the chorus would be where I thought the verse was, and vice versa. Often you'd be writing something and you think, okay, well, that's the intro part, and there's the verse, and he's going to start singing here, and then there's a bridge, and that's going to be the chorus. And then you get in the studio and you get to the verse part where you think he's going to sing, and he doesn't sing anything. I'm thinking, okay. And then when the bridge comes, he starts singing. So he says, actually, that bridge part, can that be longer because I haven't got enough of those chords to sing, you know, what you thought was going to be the verse, you know? So you're kind of like thinking, okay, so what was going to be just an eight bar bridge now has to become a 16 bar verse. And so you're constantly moving things around because, but that was made it exciting, you know? It, it did, it made you kind of, you know, kept you on your toes, as it were. Um, so the main thing was when you're supplying uh, a song to him, wasn't to, you, you couldn't, you, you, you know, you, you couldn't just sing a kind of a cassette of you playing an acoustic guitar for chord sequence. You'd have to kind of come up and conjure a backing track, as it were, that had a vibe. So it would give him the inspiration to do something in a particular way. Uh, as I say, you know, every, every time I sent uh, him um, kind of demos for the first album, they were complete with bass lines you know, hook the drum pattern that I wanted, the kind of guitar sound and so on, so that it kind of, it, it had to inspire him. Because if he sent me something that didn't inspire him, it wouldn't get used. So you had to kind of make sure it was, gave him something that he could latch on to and think, okay, that's good. And as I say, once he's done that, I'm not saying he's going to sing where you think the verse is going to be. It, it might end up being you'll sing a chorus over that and sing a verse over the bridge, but still, you've got to give him enough to latch onto. In February 1988, the first single from the new album was released. Although some had questioned the proposition of Morrissey without Marr, Suedehead was an instant success and reached number five in Britain, the highest chart position Morrissey had ever achieved. I still think Suedehead is as good as anything the Smiths ever did. I can hear the Smiths doing it as well. And you wonder whether these ideas maybe were knocking around Morrissey's mind lyrically before the dissolution of the Smiths. But I heard Sweden and thought, this is a brilliant record, this is everything I expected from the Smiths. It's kind of glamorous, it's kind of radiant, it's melodic, it's anthemic. It's funny, actually, thinking back on Suedehead, it was a song that I wrote around a bass line. And the bass line is very Andy Rock like it is, I admit. You know, it's got that kind of springiness to it and melodic, it jumps around a bit, you know, it's not just playing a root note vibe. And that song was written after I sent my original tape in to Morrissey and... Um, and he said, yes, he wanted to, you know, do an album. Then, obviously, I went back home and wrote some more songs, and Suedehead was one of those songs that I wrote in that period between him saying he wanted to do an album and actually starting the album. Uh, and um, we did... I remember recording it and thinking, musically, it sounded, you know, it was sounding really promising even before I put a vocal on, but once I heard a guide vocal that he put down for it, I thought, this is great. So it was one of the first songs we recorded on the session. I think we went in the studio October of that year, and in that first week session, we did do Suedehead. And uh, I knew once we tracked that and I heard his vocal go on properly, you know, onto the track, I just thought, this is it. We've got, actually, we've got a really good hit here. A month after the release of Suedehead, Morrissey's debut solo album, Viva Hate, confirmed that the singer was far from lost without Marr. Despite the inevitable comparisons to the Smiths' back catalogue, Viva Hate nevertheless emerged as a unique and successful work, and both the critics and the public embraced it wholeheartedly. Viva Hate, I think, is a great album. I think you've got, you've got someone playing the, the, uh, the sparring partner to Marr through Stephen Street, and also Stephen Street's learnt everything from, you know, in essence, that he knows about production from the Smiths. He's obviously done other bands as well, but uh, he's, it's a gift, really, to produce Morrissey and be that other, per that other person. Um, it's quite a unique position to be in. I, I can't recall any other such uh, occurrences of that. You are the songwriter and the producer where before it was someone else. Um, it's very strange. So you get Swayedhead, of course, classic single. Um, but then there's political things on there, like Margaret on the guillotine, and, and and all the usual sort of controversy with 
Bengalian platforms and things like that. What's, what's going on there? Is, what's he saying? Is it is, is he is he being racist or is he uh, is he being comforting? Is he is he taking that usual outsider approach? You don't know. So straight to number one, classic. Great, Morrissey's done it. He's, he's pulled that coup. He's he's disbanded the Smiths or the Smiths have uh, imploded and and he's now retained this wonderful solo career at the other end. How's he done that? That's quite a thing to pull off. Although the musicians and songwriters had changed, Fever Hate was marked by the same mastery of language that Morrissey had brought to the Smiths, further demonstrating his ability to create pop music in which lyrical content was as important as the tunes themselves. I do like his lyrics enormously. Um, there is an edge to them, a very cutting edge. They're not in the style of an Ian Curtis, which has a sort of T.S. Eliot approach. They're not in the style of Bernard of New Order, which has a kind of nonsense lyricism. Um, they're quite flowing in terms of, of, the, of the rhythm of the poetry. They're quite flowing and also quite sharp. And that's quite an achievement. But then again, Morris is quite a sharp person. You know, when it comes down to it, you know, I don't think there's anyone that can be better than him. And um, I think that's why the songs have lasted so well. I really do. It's not just because of the music, but because lyrically people can find something in each song, whether it be laughter, whether it be, you know, joy, whether it be sadness. They'll, you'll find it there, you know. And he's a great lyricist, there's no doubt. That Morrissey had succeeded in escaping from under the shadow of Ma was in little doubt. The singer's transition from frontman to solo performer had been relatively seamless, and as the album enjoyed strong worldwide sales, it appeared that the public were only too willing to accept his new role in popular music. There remain, however, questions over the authorship of Viva Hate. Vinnie Riley, the guitarist on the album, claims that it was he and not the credited Stephen Street who composed the album, and that Street's tracks were scrapped during his initial meeting with the producer. They played me three to four demos of, that Stephen Street had done for Morrissey to put vocals to um, and asked if I would play them and, and I kind of said well well I was kind of quite shocked because the demos were just so appalling they were just so um, they were just uh, they were just crass I mean really you know like folk folk you know three chords all the way through so that kind of dismayed me a bit that was my that was my initial uh, feeling and, and also the I could sense uh, Morrissey's great unease. He was very uh, uneasy once the demos began to play. I, I was very dismayed when I heard the demos and very disappointed. Um, but I liked Stephen Street. I'd worked with him on two albums previously, two Dur 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 Column albums. So um, I, I was kind of a bit thrown, but I just, I suggested that, well, I, w I did want to work on this project. Um, but the basis had to be that I, I had to be able to be in charge of the, the, the music, basically. We, we should jettison those demos because they were, they were a joke. They were really awful. Uh, Morrissey knew they were, and um, everyone, I mean, we all knew they were. So, um, but it was difficult because Stephen Street was, was kind of a, like a very close friend by that point and someone that Morrissey trusted, which is something that he doesn't normally do. So Stephen Street was very paranoid that I was trying to take, take over as a writer. So in order to allay his fears, I, I said, which is a mistake, I now realise, but I actually said, well, I don't want any of the writing credits. I just want to do the music, you know, 